I would like to call this meeting to order. Will you all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Reed? Here. Vice Mayor Woods? Here, ma'am. Councilmember Tinsley? Here. Councilmember Primoroso? Here. Councilmember Middleton? Here. Thank you. Are there any additions, deletions, or modifications to our agenda this evening? No, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Next, we're going to go on to announcements and presentations. If we could please have Dr. Casey Lucius to the podium. Dr. Lucius is from the International City County Management Association, or ICMA, to make the presentation to our city of Palm Beach Gardens in the celebration of 50 years of governance under our city manager form of government. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. I'm Casey Lucius, Assistant City Manager with the City of Marco Island. But here tonight, I'm representing the Florida City and County Management Association, along with some of my colleagues and regional city managers and assistant city managers. FCCMA recognizes cities for having a council manager form of government, and Palm Beach Gardens has had a city council, a council manager form of government for 50 years. That's a great accomplishment, and I wanna congratulate you. While the city was incorporated in 1959, it was in 1973 that Palm Beach Gardens was recognized by the International City and County Management Association for having a council manager form of government. That's why tonight we celebrate 50 years for you having the best type of local government. And congratulations because next year you'll get to celebrate 65 years as a city. I wanna recognize your city manager, Mr. Ron Ferris, who has been with you for 23 years and has been a professional city manager for 33 years. Palm Beach Gardens is a great example of a council manager form of government. It works well when there's a combination of your political leadership and Ron's executive and administrative expertise. You really are a model for local governments all over Florida and throughout the country. I also wanna recognize your deputy city manager, Lori Lavaria, for her leadership as the 2022-2023 FCCMA president. Congratulations to the city of Palm Beach Gardens for your stability and professionalism and for the fair and ethical manner in which you govern. Congratulations. I th would you like us to, um, I'd like our city manager to actually come down with us tonight, please. <laughs>
That's quite the honor. We're especially uh, thankful that so many city managers from other municipalities were here to celebrate with us tonight. We all have busy schedules, especially a city manager. So having them come out tonight was really wonderful. And uh, thank you again, Ron, for your service and Lori for your leadership as president this year. Uh, we're going to move on for comments from the public for subjects not on the agenda. I uh, don't believe we have any cards. I do have one coming up for consent. So we'll move on to our city manager report. Ron, do you have a report tonight? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, we wanted to give a, a brief uh, discussion on our one of our latest events, uh, the tornado. Is David, you ready? Um, David Reyes is our emergency uh, management director, along with a few other titles. And David has a brief uh, report for you as to the the damage of the tornado and how it was responded to and uh, where we've left it at this point. Uh, good evening. For the record, David Reyes, Community Services Administrator and Director of Emergency Management. And I'm just going to give you a brief update on the events uh, from this past Saturday. <clears throat> so as you all know, we, um, city, experienced uh, a pretty significant event Saturday afternoon. Uh, National Weather Service uh, rated the tornado as an F2, winds up to 130 miles per hour. The start time of this was around 5.10 in the afternoon, and end time was 5.21. So it really only lasted about 11 minutes, but it was 11 minutes that was sufficient time to cause a lot of damages in a lot of our neighborhoods. So you can see in this map, this is the path. Uh, that started around the Garden Seas apartment just south of the Palm Beach uh, Gardens Medical Center. And it moved northeast through some of our communities, saying there was States, Rainwood, Town Oaks, and then it went north, northeast, um, and then stopped just shy before uh, the town of Juno Beach. <clears throat> some of the issues reported, it's you know, a lot of roof damage, you know, both commercial, residential, a lot of trees down, uprooted trees, uh, power lines down. We have several areas, a lot of power outages, traffic signals. There were a lot of minor to moderate structural uh, damages to buildings, and most of the moderate to structural were commercial structures. Residential received more minor uh, damages, most of a roof uh, related to those. Uh, plenty of vehicle damages, a lot of the vehicles, either because trees fell on top of it and some cars that were flipped, some with um, uh, people inside of those vehicles. And PGA Boulevard and US-1 uh, had to be shut down for several hours just because the damages to the power lines on that intersection were significant and took FPL crews a long time to repair. Um, EOC activation, the city implemented a partial EOC, so immediately after around 5:10, when we received the first call, crews started coming into the city, and at that point, we started activating EOC, so we have teams from fire department, police, public services, construction services, engineering, all those teams were activated to come into the city. Uh, we established a unified command, and we put in a partial emergency operations center team to support those teams out on the road to be able to provide, in addition to some other agencies that were also involved. So what are the response actions? The fire department was the first one to establish that unified command, so all the communication from the field to the EOC came from the fire department. Um, they responded to brush fire, power lines down, fire alarms, car accidents, some traumatic injur injuries. A uh, total of 31 calls came in within that time frame. 17 of those were within the city, and then the other 14 were outside the city. The police department received 284 phone calls between that same period of time. They responded to 20 of those calls, and then uh, some uh, intersections that were non-functioning. Uh, they did one well check, traffic crash and assist the fire department and some of the mutual aid uh, response. They also had to maintain the US-1 PGA closed for the entire time uh, doing the repairs. <clears throat> Public services crews came in to work. They established three teams that were here by 5.30. Remember, the, the event started at 5.10. By 5.30, the first teams were here. Fire and police were already on site. And they started clearing debris from all the areas by 11 p.m. at night 
all the debris was clear, all the roads were open, and we were able to assess all the, the, the residents, anybody that was affected by the, the storm. Um, construction services and engineer also came in. They started doing assessment of the structure. Our priority was to make sure that any structure that received damage, we wanted to make sure, are they safe? If they're not safe, that we could notify the residents, we could take the appropriate action. So they inspected every neighborhood and every structure in this city to make sure safety conditions and what were the conditions of the damage for those structures. And this is part of our plan even for uh, hurricanes to where those teams are here in the city ready to respond immediately after the storm. We don't wait, they're here. For this event, they were here around six o'clock and they started the event uh, and the assessment. Some pictures of uh, the damages, but I'm sure that a lot of you already seen most of those pictures already in the media and the news. So this was our response, and basically bottom line is our teams were already here within 30 minutes of the event, and nobody went home until we ensured that every resident was safe. So once again, the communication, cooperation between the department, it's just second to none, and we were able to respond to this event uh, fairly quick. So I'm able to answer any questions you may have. All right, council. Yeah, I just had one question with regards to um, how do you prioritize, David, what you tackle first? Our, our health and safety first, our roads first, opening up things. What, what do we tackle first when we have everybody going? So number one priority is health and safety. So we work together, fire and police, anywhere that they need to get access to, that's our number one priority. So my crews are gonna make sure that they have access to respond to our residents. That's our number one priority. So we just push debris out of the road. It's not about making it look good. It's about make sure that they have access to every resident as quick as we can. After that, then we go back and then we start doing more um, in-depth cleanup and, and what you need to do. But that's our number one priority. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? All right. Yeah. Ron? If I may. Um, the employees, uh, police, fire, public works, recreation, every employee that uh, makes themselves available to respond to an emergency. Uh, we use the same uh, a procedure uh, during the hurricanes with a little, but we have time to prepare for that. Uh, but it's still the same procedure. Everyone, uh, fortunately, we have uh, retained a lot of employees over the years. And over the years, uh, their response to natural disasters, man-made disasters, is always the same. The approach is the same. They know their job. They do their job. They're conscientious about what they do. And they're serious about serving these citizens here. Uh, and what makes that work for us so well is the consistency over the year of a, a good plan, well-trained employees, dedicated employees, and those who have been retained here for a long time, they know what to do. They don't even have to be told. So that is a compliment to David and the emergency management response from all of the departments, the police, the fire, everyone uh, knows their job and they don't wait to be told what to do. So they just spring into action. And for that, David, I think you've done a fantastic job over the years of putting this together. <laughs> Uh, next, in the same vein, <clears throat> uh, we're looking at uh, a new season coming up in June, the hurricane season, and uh, staff has met at the department head level and discussed how we're going to communicate uh, to our residents uh, about what to do. You know that we've received a lot of increase in our population recently, and a lot of those residents have had no experience whatsoever with hurricanes. So we're trying to come up with the best plan that we can to inform our new residents and re-inform uh, the existing residents of uh, what's available to them to help them prepare. Candace? Hi. So um, long before we knew that a tornado was going to come through our city, um, our internal committee started planning for hurricane season. And a big part of that is how we communicate uh, to residents and make sure that they have the resources they need to be prepared should a hurricane strike. This week is hurricane preparedness week, um, conveniently. 
And um, I just wanted to go over quickly what we have planned as some of our outreach for residents. Um, you may remember a few years ago, every resident received a refrigerator magnet that asked if they were storm ready and it gave them phone numbers and information that they might need uh, to prepare for a storm or in, in the event that one occurs. We are going to mail this magnet again to every resident. Last year, we remailed our hurricane guide. So that was the second mailing since we created that um, document. We will reissue the magnets this year. Everyone will get a fresh one in case they've moved or again to capture new residents. Uh, that's the first thing. <clears throat> we also, uh, with David's help as emergency management director and um, identifying uh, the important um, information that residents would need to know, uh, my team in communications will be creating a video campaign that we will show throughout hurricane season um, that will go on our social media platforms. We also will be increasing the president presence of hurricane related messaging on the city website. So we know that we have that readiness page, it's under emergency management. So during hurricane season, we will just make sure that's more prominent on our home pages so that residents can find it immediately uh, when they visit the website. We also have um, a storm ready video we did uh, last year, I believe. And um, we have updated that storm ready concept and we will be showing a short 60 second version in our local theater and um, at some local churches that we've coordinated with beginning in June. June is the start of hurricane season. So we're in preparedness mode now. We'll move that into June as well. And um, you've seen our sandwich boards, our A-frames. We use them at the green market. They are a great way to communicate with people who are out at city facilities and parks. So we're gonna capitalize on that with signage re pertaining to hurricane readiness. And our goal is to include a QR code that will drive traffic to the digital version of our hurricane guide. Um, and with that, we hope to reach a lot of residents and maybe even some visitors in our, in our parks and facilities. And then last but not least, we have a fleet of vehicles that roll around town. Um, so we're gonna put that QR code again to the hurricane guide on the back of our vehicles um, in the form of a magnet throughout hurricane season. Um, and we hope to catch some attention and, and pique some curiosity with that as well. And that's all I have, unless there are any questions. Thank you, Candace. I keep my hurricane guide in a little waterproof box with all my hurricane supplies right at the tippy top and the magnets on the fridge all year long. I'm excited that our new residents will get to have a new magnet. And um, again, the hurricane guide is online all the time for anyone who ever needs it, yes. right? It is there year round uh, on our hurricane readiness page and um, everything there is still relevant. It's good information, and especially for those who have never lived in a place that has hurricanes, um, it, it really teaches them from the foundation up what they need to know. Let me turn it to my council. Do you guys have Dana? Yeah, I'm sorry, I have one quick question, Candace. Um, this looks great, thank you for all the communication. You always do a great job. If somebody needed a hard copy of the Hurricane Guide, are they available, particularly to seniors who don't have access to the internet and things like that? They are available. I have a supply here at City Hall. Um, I think there's some maybe on our table there when you walk in. Um, and throughout the month of June, we actually will have fire rescue there with the table to talk about hurricane um, preparedness, and we will have guides available at, at those outings as well. Great question, anything else? Okay, Ron, are you all set? We're good, thank right. you. I'll go on to the next. Thank you, Candace. Um, just some city updates on some of our projects, very briefly, uh, with the uh, $20 million uh, revenue bond. We've all, as far as Kyoto Gardens Bridge is concerned, uh, we've hired a consultant, Kim Lee Horn, and they're gonna start on the project immediately and giving us the options that we need to look at for the bridge widening. Uh, Burns Road Center, the modernization and expansion, uh, that project is currently out for bid. Uh, it, closing date is the 26th of May, and we hope to begin that construction uh, sometime in September. 
<clears throat> the Oaks Park pickleball courts, parking lot expansion and bathrooms. Uh, the site plan has been designed and approved. We expect to begin, con begin construction sometime this month and our goal is to complete it by fall. Um, another facility that we're continuing to work on is the Nest Golf Facility, which is the PAR-3. Uh, we hope to get our CO uh, later sometime this month, 1st of June, uh, and uh, we hope to have that up and operating late July, uh, early August. Uh, also, uh, this past few months, we've had some very extraordinary special events. And uh, one of those is the uh, Oak Parks Butterfly Grand Opening that we had on uh, March 3rd. It was well attended by our Riverside kids. Uh, and as you can see, some older kids uh, behind them uh, cutting ribbons and having a good time. Uh, it was a very effective uh, butterfly habitat. and. I hope all of you get a chance to go by and see it. Next, on uh, March 30th, we were able to uh, cut the ribbon for the uh, Miracle League Bank Shot, uh, Bank Shot program, at which time our mayor was upstaged quite handily by the young man in the uh, red shirt with the microphone who just took it out of her hand and did everything that you could possibly imagine and did it correctly. It was quite impressive. At the same time, the same date, uh, we also uh, opened uh, the baseball, Miracle League baseball season as well. It's a fantastic facility, it's a fantastic program, and everybody just had a very great and warm time. <clears throat> also later on, on Friday, March 31st, we did the uh, glow with the flow egg hunt. That's how many people it took to put this on, uh, and no kidding, and that's only a small portion of the eggs that were out there, so we believe that all of the kids and the grown-ups actually had a good time with this event. It's always a successful event and well attended. So thanks to our Parks and Recreation Department for all the things they do to, for the residents out here in this community. Uh, also, I changed the subject a little bit. I would like to recognize uh, a 24-year-old veteran. I mean, working here for 24 years old, 24 years. Patty Snyder, our city clerk, has been with the city for 24 years, and uh, I'd just like to recognize her for the great job she does. Her dedication is just, she just loves this city. And so I just wanted to do that. <laughs> I'll pay for that later. <laughs> the next thing I'd like to show is, uh, you know, all of you council members are out there working in the community, doing things and representing this council. Uh, each and every one of you at one event or another, but there was one particular event that came up that I thought was uh, very impressive and that you all might enjoy seeing, and that's our Vice Mayor Carl Woods at the uh, Education Foundation of Palm Beach County Golf Tournament on Thursday, April 20th. I'll pay for this too because he didn't know I was going to do this, but here he is welcoming everyone to the Education Foundation Golf Tournament. You bet. I wouldn't miss it. Good. <laughs> Perfect. Carl, did, did if you, you haven't played oh, this it, course yeah. before, you're going to love it. It is fantastic here. My name's Carl Woods. I'm the vice mayor for the city of Palm Beach Gardens. 
And I know you guys are all over the place, all over the state, maybe even out of the state. But if you haven't played this course before, you're going to love it. It is fantastic here. Um, we have a little bit of a tradition in Palm Beach Gardens. So if you are a former veteran, active duty military, law enforcement, nurse, or doctor, would you please raise your hand and give everybody a round of applause who supports our country and our safety so we can play golf today. Thank you very much, guys, for your support. Good enough. That'll be my last report, <laughs> maybe ever. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's nice to have a city manager report that, you know, we had some bittersweet news at the beginning because, you know, we had this horrible situation with a tornado that arrived. But to spend the last part of it smiling so much, my cheeks now hurt, was uh, a rare and wonderful thing. If, if we could, I'm just going to, well, you mentioned Patty's 24 years. We know yours are, Ron, Ron, by the way, has 23 years here. So... Patty's the senior, and our city council would like to present. <laughs> in case you're wondering, but our, our clerk's main function is really the foundation of our council. We all lean on her for everything, honestly. She's, she's really the one in charge of us, and she's dedicated part of our staff uh, at the top of her profession and is absolutely the heart of everything that happens here. So um, Dana actually kept this orchid alive all week so that we could give it to you. So if you could excuse me for one moment. You know, we do say we're a family, and it, it all trickles down. So thank you guys so much. Um, and, and then lastly, to, to where we started, on behalf of our council, our hearts go out to anybody who is still managing any damage from the tornado. But again, we are so proud and thankful that we have the extraordinary staff that we do. So anything else, guys, before we move on? All right, let's move on. We're moving on to our consent agenda. Uh, does anyone have anything they would like to pull from consent tonight? All right, I'm not going to pull it, but I do want to thank Palm Beach State College. It was Proclamation E and congratulate them on their 90th anniversary. That's a very big deal. Uh, thank you for bringing your students and your representatives this evening. And I also want to th um, mention pro the Proclamation for Mental Health Awareness and Trauma-Informed Care Month. Thank you for all you do. For those that do work in mental health, we know more than ever how incredibly important that is. And then lastly, it is Professional Municipal Clerks Week, ironically enough, the week that you're celebrating your anniversary. So off we go. Let's, uh, if nothing's been pulled, um, we'll move along. All right, so can I get a motion and a second to approve the consent? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. May I get a second? Second. Great. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Any opposed? None. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you very much. Tonight we are holding quasi-judicial hearings on the following cases. Resolution 24, 2023, Osprey Isles Planned Unit Development. Ordinance 8, at first reading, a planned unit development rezoning. Resolution 22, excuse me, Resolution 22, 2023, Site Plan and Major Conditional Use Approval, and Resolution 23, 2023, Gardens Business Center Site Plan. This means that the City Council is required by law to base its decision on the evidence contained in the record of this proceeding, which consists of the testimony at the hearing, the materials which are in the official city file on this application, and any documents presented during this hearing. The Council also requires by law to allow cross-examination of any witnesses who testify tonight. Cross-examination may occur after the staff, the applicant, or other participants have made their presentations and will be permitted in the order of the witness's appearance. It is necessary that anyone who testifies at the hearing remain until the conclusion of the hearing in order to be avail able to respond to any questions. If you plan to testify this evening or wish to offer written comments, please fill out a card over here to my right, your left if you're in the audience, and uh, pass it over to our city clerk by the orchids. You can find her there. The city clerk will now swear in all persons who intend to offer testimony this evening on any of these cases. Please rise. Thank you.
Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. All right. Thank you, Patty. So we're going to be moving on to public hearings. This is a non-quasi-judicial public hearing. It's Ordinance 4, 2023. If the clerk could please read the title. It's actually pre-recorded, Mayor. Oh, I could see why. Thank you. Ordinance 4, 2023, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending Chapter 78, Land Development Regulations at Section 78-57, Targeted Expedited Permitting Program by repealing subsection A, B, and C, readopting same as revised, and by adopting new subsection D, further amending Chapter 78 by adopting new Section 78-59, Workforce and Affordable Housing Program. Further amending Chapter 78 at Section 78-99 exemptions and credits by repealing subsection B, C, and D, readopting same as revised, and by adopting new subsection E. Further amending Chapter 78 at Section 78-141 residential zoning district regulations by amending Table 10 property development regulations, residential zoning districts, and by adopting new Note 11 to Table 10. Further amending Chapter 78 at Section 78-154 PUD, Plan Unit Development Overlay District by repealing subsections G1, G2, and G4, readopting same as revised. And by amending Table 13, PUD Residential Density Limits. Further amending Chapter 78 at Section 78-155 PCD, Plan Community Development Overlay District, PCD, by repealing subsections E1, NG, readopting same as revised, and by amending Table 15, maximum residential density in PCDs, further amending Chapter 78 at Section 78-157, MXD, Mixed Use Development District, by repealing subsection A and readopting same as revised, further amending Chapter 78 at Section 78-159, permitted uses, minor and major conditional uses, and prohibited uses by adopting new subsection J78 and amending table 21, permitted conditional and prohibited use chart, further amending chapter 78 at section 78-181 uses by repealing subsection C8, readopting same as revised, and by adopting new subsection C9, further amending chapter 78 at section 78-222, transit-oriented development TOD overlay district by repealing subsection F5 and readopting same as revised, providing that each and every other section and subsection of Chapter 78 land development shall remain in full force and effect as previously adopted, providing a conflicts clause, a separability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. Thank you, Patty. It, and the real Patty, we appreciate it too. I'm going to open the hearing. If we could have Joanne Scaria. Scaria, I keep on working on it to the podium, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Patty, and good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of the Council. It is my pleasure to present the ordinance for the Workforce Housing Land Development Regulations Amendment. Uh, Joanne Scaria, with Dr Assistant Director of Planning and Zoning. The subject request is to amend the city's code to implement the priority strategies that were approved in the city's adopted workforce housing program when the City Council adopted Resolution 66, 2020. To give a brief background, in 2020, staff with the um, assistance of a consultant reviewed a wide range of workforce housing solutions and strategies, and those solutions and strategies were prioritized and color-coded. And just to provide a brief reminder, there were certain strategies such as inclusionary zoning and linkage fees and uh, other strategies that were identified as not appropriate for the City of Palm Beach Gardens at this time, and certain strategies identified in green that you see on your screen that were the top priority strategies. And um, there was a third category of solutions that were uh, identified as appropriate for a future, future date. And so the purpose of this amendment is to implement the eight top priority workforce housing solutions that require land development regulations amendments. So this has resulted in a new code section in the city's land development regulations. 
And uh, I just want to take a moment to um, clarify that the purpose of this ordinance is not to replace or supplant the workforce housing program that was adopted in 2020 that is still in effect and in full, you know, in all, everything that it recommended. But the purpose of this ordinance is really to provide clarifications and details on the zoning aspects of that program. And it is the um, basis or the uh, intent of this program to be an incentive based program while still maintaining and enhancing the city's character and quality of life. The new code section includes definitions that are primarily already existing in the city's comprehensive plan with some helpful updates. So there's a new definition for area median income, and the workforce housing definition has been included to reference the Florida Housing Finance Corporation chart, a snippet of which is shown on the screen here. The new code section also discusses workforce housing areas, primarily being the TOD, which is already in place through the D TOD uh, policies and regulations. And the updated uh, location is citywide. Um, so that includes the residential high, mixed use, and residential medium zoning categories. The new code section also formally uh, recognizes and identifies the Workforce Housing Fund, which is an existing account and line item in the city's budget, and protects those funds for workforce housing purposes. And then the, the most, uh, uh, the key part of this ordinance is actually the incentives and strategies, primarily being the density and height bonus, and with that, impact fee waivers, building permit fee waivers, expedited permitting, and accessory dwelling units. So the first incentive category for density and height bonuses, this new section in the city's code includes a very helpful chart that um, breaks down by zoning district the amount of density bonus that's available. You can see that uh, in a column here. And the associated additional height bonus that's available with that density bonus. Projects, in order to receive these density bonuses, must meet certain eligibility criteria. Namely, 10% of the project, must, a minimum of 10% must be reserved for workforce and or And we are also looking for a minimum quantity of at least 10 workforce housing units in that project. We also would like the unit mix to be adequately proportional so that a project is not providing only one bedrooms, um, and then it also clarifies the workforce and affordable housing income qualification levels according to the chart that I showed earlier. The new code section also includes um, guidelines on restriction and monitoring, typically a minimum of 30 years unless it, uh, the financing mechanism requires more. And there's also a requirement for an annual monitoring report. With the introduction of these density and height bonuses, staff looked at compatibility of these projects with the surrounding neighborhoods. And in order to protect that, staff included additional setback requirements, um, as well as an additional setback f based on height, as well as an additional setback based on being adjacent to a single family residential neighborhood. We also have enhanced buffering and uh, exam for an example, access from an arterial roadway. So on your screen is an example of a five acre site and um, the building envelopes that you see color coded are providing an example of a residential medium project. Um, this project does have access from an arterial roadway and um, there is no adjacent single family residential. And then when you look at the same site and apply the additional RH zoning category standards, you can see how that building envelope shrinks or contracts towards the center of the site. The next incentive included in the ordinance is um, a waiver of impact fees associated with the workforce and or affordable housing units. And that is tiered based on the percentage provided and there is a cap of $250,000 per year. There's also a waiver of building permit fees that's applicable with a cap of $100,000 per project. There's also uh, an update to the city's existing TEPP, or Targeted Expedited Permitting Program Code, to include workforce housing projects. 
And finally, there is a new category added to the city's table of uh, permitted uses, allowing accessory dwelling units in the lower density residential zoning districts and providing some design standards for those accessory dwelling units. The city, in addition to meeting the minimum public notice requirements of publishing in the newspaper, did coordinate with members of the business community, including the PGA Corridor Association and the Palm Beach North Chamber, and uh, a copy of the ordinance was sent to them, and we actually did even have an opportunity to meet with some of the representatives from the business community, and they were able to offer some helpful suggestions that were incorporated into the ordinance, and we have received letters of support from both the Corridor Association and the Chamber. And with that, staff recommends approval. Um, happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you, Joanne. Does anyone wish to speak on this before we go forward? No? All right, we do have two comment cards. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, may I please call Jack Weir to the podium if you could state your name and address and if you've been sworn in. Hi. Good evening. Jack Weir, 5604 PGA Boulevard, Palm Beach Gardens. Um, I'm here to address you tonight on behalf of the Housing Leadership Council. As some of you know, I'm chairman of the board, um, and uh, we had the opportunity to consider this proposed ordinance at our last board meeting, so I want to convey to you that the Housing Leadership Council supports it and urges your approval. Um, uh, it's an incentive-based program. It supplements your existing program, as Joanne pointed out, and uh, it establishes the Workforce Housing Trust Fund, formalizes that, uh, height and density bonuses, particularly in PUDs and transit-oriented developments, and uh, waiver of impact and building permit fees. So those are all positive steps. Um, they are incentives that we hope will promote more workforce housing units in the projects uh, that are proposed for the gardens. So we urge approval, and thanks for the opportunity to address you. Thank you, sir. I have Joey Eichner from the PGA Corridor Association. Name, address, and if you've been sworn in, please. Joey Eichner, on behalf of the PGA Corridor Association, I have been sworn in. <clears throat> the mission of the PGA Corridor Association is to preserve, enhance, and promote the PGA Corridor as the premier business location in Palm Beach County. The PGA Corridor Association appreciates, appreciates the opportunity to work with staff um, and provide meaningful input when reviewing these ordinances. Uh, in review of the most recent draft, we found that the proposed ordinance provides clarity and specific regulations consistent with our support of the city's vision for long-term sustainability. We all know that workforce housing and, and affordable housing for, for our, our teachers, our, our first responders, is critical to the, sustaining, uh, the sustainability of a city, and we urge you to support this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I don't have any other cards, so I'm going to close the hearing. May I get a motion and a second to approve, please? Bert? I'll make a motion to approve Ordinance 4. Thank you. I'll As, second. There you go. Thank you so much. All right, let's bring it back for discussion. Start with you, Marcy, since you are Actually, Bert made the motion. I apologize. No, Marcy made the motion. I thought Bert was going to. Marcy made the motion. I'm sorry. There go ahead. There was a long pause. Yeah, there was a pause. <laughs> Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I fully support this. Um, obviously, time is money, and I appreciate the fact that this um, adds expediting permitting opportunities. I think that's uh, an awesome uh, workforce housing, attainable housing, uh, and, and economic development actually is part of our strategic priorities, and it's something that everyone has been asking for for quite some time. Um, it's a, this is a tool to help achieve that, so we really appreciate you putting this before us. And I fully understand and agree that allowing density bonus opportunities is a big incentive, and I appreciate that, and allowing additional height is also um, the best way to achieve at a density. So with that said, I know it's hard to um, digest and visualize a building that's you know over 100 feet because it's not the norm in our city, but the TOD is the best place for it. So um, that's also um, appreciative. And uh, staff, you guys did a great job um, adding regulations to the setbacks for the higher buildings. Um, that was very thoughtful. Um, 
knowing that a landscape buffer is not going to really hide a tall building, so you guys really did a good job um, with that additional um, setbacks. Um, I just wanted to confirm that the density bonus requests um, still have to come before the council for approval, correct? Yes, ma'am. And um, I, we don't have to look into it now, but a little something that just concerns me and maybe we need to look into it in the future is the, the new, brand new Live Local Act and how it affects this because of the you know, one mile radius language. And so I think we obviously all need to kind of die, you know, look at that and reread it because it's brand new and we don't, I'm not quite sure how it's gonna affect everybody because whatever is um, affordable and that, that meets that criteria doesn't have to come before council, but I'm so grateful that we have you as staff after reading that, um, that legislation because it was passed by our governor and I have 100% confidence that you will take care of it. <laughs> Yes, ma'am, we're, we're closely tracking that legislation and participating with, in, in all the forums that are being hosted to better understand the legislation and understand how it specifically affects our city. And uh, you know, it, it, it's fully anticipated that that bill is amended next session as well. So it's going to be just, uh, it's, it's going to be a long journey. Yeah, um, but there, there will have to be land development regulation amendments most likely due to the bill. Thank you. Excellent, Bert. Uh, no, Marcy covered a lot of my topics. Um, I appreciate uh, the density setback, obviously, from the existing residents. That's always a big issue when we're looking at different projects around the city, so that's important. The incentives we have to do, I mean, you got to encourage kind of that to come into the city and build the low uh, affordable housing uh, within those units. Um, and we, you know, we want to bring our kids back. You know, I, I remember uh, Mayor Russo used to always talk about our kids want to come back to the city that we that they were raised in, that they're where their families are. So to make things a little bit more affordable for some of these jobs to to get these uh, kids to come back and develop and grow the city um, from where we are. So I appreciate all the effort, and I know you guys will stay on top of it. I don't really worry about that with staff involved. So you'll you'll do the right thing when the projects come in, and then we'll support as needed. So thank you. Thank you, Dana. Um, I think you did a great job in the presentation. It was very articulate and, uh, you know, very um, informative, and, and I understand everything um, with it. I had one quick question about how many projects will this impact that we have currently going on right now? Any? Any projects that you... Uh, we have a few projects going on right now because we already have somewhat of a foundation of an incentive program based on the TOD uh, because we already have an existing density bonus and many developers have already taken advantage. The Richmond Group has a 400 unit building with a 10% commitment al already coming out of the ground. So they actually won't be impacted by this because they're already under construction. Uh, and so we hope that more developers with these tools being in place will come forward, uh, but there's no current pending projects that are actively under construction that should be impacted by this. Thank you. All right, excellent. Carl? There's nothing left to be said. I mean, uh, we've been going this direction a long time. Staff works great with the community. Um, we have two important people that have big voices in the community that spoke tonight, so thank you guys. And uh, when we work together with the community and government, we make good choices, everybody's happy. Um, it's the direction that we need to go, it's the next step. So that's all I have to say about it. Great job, good presentation, thank you for that. All right, so just to finish it off, you know, it's just one more step in our roadmap, right? If, if you build it, or they will come as, as we're working on it. And to echo what Bert said, absolutely our biggest export is, is our kids. So it would be lovely to have them be able to live in this urban core or in a granny flat, which is actually, my mother lives in an, an area that she's pretty excited about the opportunity to have an accessory dwelling unit. So personally, why not? Maybe one of my kids will wind up in there. But no, we do. We provide ourselves on a high level of service, our low tax rate, the ability to respond. All of that matters, but that is what builds a thriving economy. And if we don't have our service ability within within the area where we all live then it's just not going to work out so this is this is extraordinary and the fact that you guys actually began working on this before everyone started moving here is what i find the most amazing i don't know where your crystal ball is but excellent work and this is immaculate we look forward to um 
That sounds like a pass. So hearing no further discussion. Um, Madam Mayor? Oh, yes, if I just If I just want to, I'd just Please. like to acknowledge uh, the hard work because most of the underwriting was done uh, by Joanne Scaria and Olivia Ellison. They worked very hard on this and uh, uh, an ordinance of this magnitude is, you know, to be done in-house is, is, is quite a lift, but they did an excellent job and there was a lot of people working as a team on this. We had a lot of great input from, from I think, all the departments and our city attorney and, um, uh, and many folks here. So, and, and of course, the business community, which made it better. So I just want to uh, really especially acknowledge Joanne and Olivia on this one. Thank you so much, Natalie, for taking the time to do that. You guys absolutely knocked us our, our socks off. If you if you had us sum it up this quickly as well, it's extraordinary. So thank you again for and for making it something anyone in the world can digest. Whether you're a developer, or a council member, a planner, this is something that anyone can look at the charts you've provided and get a better understanding of it than, than really almost anywhere I've seen. So not only did you do an amazing job, you've distilled it for ease of access. So thank you. Thanks. All right. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion very successfully passes. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to be moving on to Ordinance 6, 2023. If Patty could please read the title. Ordinance 6, 2023, an ordinance to the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending the City of Palm Beach Gardens budget for the fiscal year beginning October 1, 2022, and ending September 30, 2023, inclusive, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Thank you so much. I'm going to open the hearing. Hello, Arianne. Has anything uh, changed since first reading? Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. For the record, my name is Arianne Panzak, Finance Administrator. Tonight is the second reading of Ordinance 6, where we are amending the budget to record the loan proceeds from the bond and to fund the project balances. And there have been no changes from the last reading. If you'd like, I can present uh, the presentation again. Council, would you like a presentation this evening? Nope. No, thank you very much. All right. <laughs> and uh, we don't have any comment cards, so we're going to go ahead and close this hearing. Thank you very much, Arian. Can I get a motion and a second to approve? I'll make a motion to move Ordinance 6, 2023 on second reading. Second. All right. So uh, any further discussion? I know this is second reading. No? All right. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much. All right. We're moving on to Resolution 24, 2023. Patty, if you could please read the title. Resolution 24, 2023, resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving an amendment to the Osprey Isles Plan Unit Development, PUD, to remove 3.36 acres from the approximately 101.36 acre PUD for a new PUD acreage of 98 acres, more or less. The subject site being generally located on the north side of North Lake Boulevard, approximately 1.27 miles east of Coconut Boulevard, as more particularly described herein, providing conditions of approval, providing effective date and for other purposes. All right. Thank you so much. We're going to need to declare ex parte on this before, and I'm going to open the hearing. Um, so ex parte regarding resolution 24, Osprey Isles. Marcy, do you have anything for ex parte? Nope. No? All right. Bert? None. Dana? Carl, do you have anything for ex parte? Thank you. All right. And neither do I. Go ahead. Let's have a staff presentation. We have Martin Fitz at our podium. Hello, sir. How are you? Good, Madam Mayor, uh, members of the council, for the, for the record, Martin Fitz, Planning and Zoning, and I have been sworn in. in. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Tonight I have a very brief presentation for you for Resolution 24, 2023. This is a PUD amendment to remove 3.36 acres, uh, or the Tract L parcel, uh, from the Osprey House PUD and to amend the master plan. Just a very brief history, I won't read all this. Uh, Osprey Isles, uh, when it was split off from the, um, from the cemetery parcel to create the residential tract or residential plan, uh, tract L was included as part of the open space for that and was also had an 80 foot access easement across that. Uh, after the uh, project was platted, tract L was sold to SCI Funeral Services and it really should have been removed from the uh, PUD at that time. So this, is, uh, this petition is actually more of housekeeping in nature and is just to correct uh, that oversight. The, part, the Tract L is, um, runs along the east side of the um, Star of David Cemetery between uh, the cemetery and the uh, Carlton Oaks PUD. Uh, 
uh, and Osprey Owls, has, the PUD has consented to the removal of tract L from the master plan. We are up to, also updating the master plan to show the removal of tract L, and we're also updating all the site data to reflect the change in the developable land and the density. It, and, uh, I will also note that Osprey Owls is completely built out, so it will not impact any future development on the site. It was publicly noticed uh, per the code and uh, went to the Planning, Zoning, and Appeals Board where they recommended approval by a vote of 7-0 and staff recommends approval of this petition. Our staff is available if you have any questions. Thank you, Martin. All right, do we want to speak on this? We will, um, we don't have any comment cards. So we want to speak for, okay. Let's see, so we're going to close the hearing. May I get a motion and a second to approve? I'll make a motion to approve ordinance six. Thank you. Do I have a second, please? I'll second. Oh, sorry, All right, lovely. All right, so Dana, since you went first, let's bring it back for discussion. Do you have any comments? Um, no, um, no, I thought it was a great presentation. Um, I know it's a housekeeping thing, and you know I feel comfortable in improving this because I know you've communicated with the residents, and the, the residents are all in a, agreement for it, so I feel comfortable. Thank you. All right. Um, just a clarification, so this is for Resolution 24, 2023. Um, let's see, let's go ahead and, Sorry. it's quite all right, you did great. If uh, Bert, I think you wanna go next? No, no comment, no, no questions, I'm good. All right, Carl? No, all awesome. right, Marcy? No comment. All right, and I have none either, so let's bring it to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye, Aye. Aye. any opposed? All right, unanimous vote. Moving along, thank you so much, Martin. I think thank you might. You, Come back up in a little bit. Let's see. So we're moving on tonight. Ordinance seven and ordinance eight will be a combined presentation. Since ordinance, excuse me, since ordinance eight is quasi-judicial, we will declare ex parte at this time. The clerk will read the titles separately for each, and then there will be a separate vote for ordinance seven and a separate vote for ordinance eight on first reading. There will also be separate hearings for ordinance seven and ordinance eight, and we will incorporate the presentations and all testimony into each hearing. So do we, uh, if we could go ahead and read the title, Patty, for ordinance seven. Ordinance 7, 2023, an ordinance to the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, adopting a small-scale amendment to the Comprehensive Plan Future Land Use Map in accordance with the mandates set forth in Chapter 163 Florida Statutes. Pursuant to application number CPSS-21-09-000019, in order to change the land use designation of a parcel on 9.88 acres in size, more or less, from professional office PO and residential medium RM to residential low RL. The subject property being generally located on the northwest corner of the intersection of North Lake Boulevard and Memorial Park Road, providing for compliance with all requirements of Chapter 163 Florida statutes, providing for transmittal to the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity, DEO, providing that the future land use map of the City of Palm Beach Gardens be amended accordingly, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for the purposes. Note to the public, there is a sign-in sheet at the front table for anyone wanting additional information from the Department of Economic Opportunity. Thank you so much, Patty. I do think we need to do ex parte. Thank you. Marcy, do you have any ex parte for this, for Ordinance 7? Bert? Nope. Dana? Nope. Carl? Nope. All right, neither do I. So we're going to move on, and I'm going to, we, I see Brian Terry is already at the podium if, uh, from Insight Studios, if you could introduce yourself. Good evening, Madam Mayor, uh, Council. My name is Brian Terry with Insight Studio. I'm excited to be here this evening. I'm sorry? I have been sworn in, correct, yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I'll run you through a brief presentation. Again, I think the item before uh, just touched on the beginnings of, of what this overall application um, is allowing to do. And, and what it is, is again, there's multiple applications. Of course, this is first reading. Um, for the small scale land use amendment, this is a downgrade of the land use from the existing uh, PO and RM to the RL designation. Again, this is to allow for the accommodation of uh, expansion of the existing uh, cemetery onto the property that fronts along North Lake Boulevard. Uh, we're also doing a rezoning across the entire property, so the existing cemetery as well as the uh, proposed uh, property will have a PUD overlay across the entire thing to bind it together as one overall development approval. 
And then um, we have major conditional use that will be heard at the second reading. Uh, and then the, there is one, one landscape waiver that's associated with the landscape buffer that's on North Lake Boulevard. Uh, we've been working with staff um, uh, for a quite a long time, working through the nuances of this waiver. At the end of the day, there's a few different items of this proposal. Um, a large seacoast easement that we have dedicated to make sure that the Carlton Oaks and the connection between Carlton Oaks and Osprey was being provided um, while they were doing that construction activity as prior to the even previous owner. Um, working through working with them to dedicate that 25 feet as well as working with uh, city engineering staff on dedication right away that will accommodate for a right turn lane for Osprey Isles as well. Um, again, just graphically to represent, you, so you can see the land areas, again, the existing cemeteries you see in yellow. Uh, the cemetery expansion, which is the property in red, again, fronting along North Lake Boulevard. Again, the current zoning and land use map are, are virtually identical. As you can see, when these properties were originally approved um, in, in unincorporated Palm Beach County, once annexed into the city, uh, they were or they were given the RM and the PO land use designations that would be consistent with what the development approval was on the property as, uh, as it was annexed, um, which, again, kind of a zoom in so you can see a little bit closer to the property itself. Uh, it is really abutted, again, to the north by the Star David Existing Cemetery, the City of West Palm Beach Fire Station, which is there on the, on the right-hand side, and then Osprey Isles and their entrance road um, that's directly to our west. This is the existing approval um, that is on the property. So again, approved in Palm Beach County, annexed. This included 125 bed congregate living facility as well as 10,000 square feet of medical office. Um, certainly, and, and I've had um, involvement on this property for uh, probably close to eight years. Um, certainly that use that was being proposed as a congregate living facility was actually owned by a, um, a substance abuse rehabilitation company that were considering utilizing that property for that use. Um, <clears throat> we had multiple conversations with the Osprey Isles community as well as Carlton Oaks. Um, but ultimately, um, this, this land has been purchased by SCI um, to do the funeral expansion, that downgrade of intensity, downgrade of use, and downgrade of uh, traffic trips, I think, is something that's been a great benefit to the overall plan. And, uh, and certainly something that has been uh, um, the, the Osprey Isles community has been very keen to follow. So as you see, there were three access points that were originally proposed on this property, one from Memorial Gardens, one from North Lake, and then one from the Osprey Isles PUD, of which those are being modified with this new proposed plan. So here, here is the, how the garden will lay out. Um, you have one access point uh, along Memorial Park Road that'll tie into the existing cemetery through the uh, in between the two mausoleums to the north, so a roadway connection will be made to integrate both gardens together. Um, this is a singular road that comes and ends in a cul-de-sac. We are eliminating the connection point to the Osprey Isles uh, Boulevard, so that will prohibit or eliminate any concern that the Osprey Isles community had with cross traffic and, and issues um, from a safety perspective. So. Uh, again, we have an existing preserve that's in this northeast corner that's being preserved. We have a buffer surrounding that and our buffers along um, each boundary that are not directly adjacent to the existing cemetery. We do anticipate it being phased, uh, a bit of a phased development plan. Again, the overall development of the site will, will occur over hopefully many years. Um, there are two mausoleums on the property. Those have been strategically located on the northern end of the property. That's one of the comments and conversations we've had with Osprey Isles as we've uh, worked through this development plan, pushing those buildings further back on the property so that they're not visible from either North Lake Boulevard or Osprey Isles uh, for the residents. Again, just architecturally, just to give you some character images, these are, these are the proposed mausoleums that will be located again in, that, in the locations I just saw. And if you haven't been on the property, just to give you some understanding of the character of the space, again, it is a lot of green space. It's, a, it's very low impact. Um, and I think that also is a benefit to, again, the corridor, North Lake Boulevard, you're gonna see green space, you're gonna see landscape buffer, you're not gonna see construction buildings um, and ALF. So with that, that's um, all I have for you this evening. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that you have. Appreciate all the work that Natalie and Martin and uh, the whole staff have done to, to help us through this process. And uh, again, happy to answer any questions you have.
Thank you so much, Mr. Terry. All right, Martin, do you have a staff presentation as well this evening? Uh, Madam Mayor, no, we, staff does not have a presentation specifically. Uh, I will note that staff does support the waiver uh, request for the buffer. Excellent. All right. Anyone else wishing to speak? We don't have any comment cards, and so I'm going to close the hearing. May I please get a motion and a second to approve? I'll, I'll make, make a motion to move Ordinance 7, 2023 on first reading. All right. Second. Bert, Carl, great. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, let's bring it back for discussion. Bert, you are the one to make the motion. Would you like to go first? Yeah, I don't see any issues with the project I mean it's it's an improvement from what it could have been I guess from a traffic perspective and then also roadways three different exits in and out um, affecting Osprey Isles and maybe um, yeah I just I'd see it as a, a totally better solution so I'm in full support of it all right thank you so much and then I'll go to Marcy and then Carl and then Dana Marcy sure thank you uh, fully support the project. Um, I do want to thank you for working with Osprey Isles and also for the dedication of the <coughs> land for the turn lane because I remember when they annexed in 2017, they had commented that they've been, and since then, they've been working with the county to try to get a turn lane there, and it's it's uh, been a real challenge. So this is really going to help them out, and I really appreciate that. So hopefully in the near future, they'll have a turn lane. Absolutely. All right, Carl? I like it. It's good for you. Um, low density. And I did have a question on the preserve area, but you answered that, as were um, the council and probably a lot of the people in the city are sensitive to the amount of preserve area we have. So you took care of that question, so I'm going to support it as is good and looking forward to it. Thank you. Excellent. All right, Dana. Um, no, it was very informative, and I don't, I don't have any questions, and I would support the project. Thank you. Right, so I do want to say I think that the uh, Osprey Isles will have much more peaceful neighbors with this plan, and um, I, the, the utilization of a garden, yes, abutting North Lake Boulevard is always appreciated, so uh, the decreased trips as well. So let's bring it to vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, passes unanimously. Let's move on to ordinance number eight, since we are... Um, having a combined presentation, and it is quasi-judicial, we're going to have the clerk read the title for Ordinance 8. Ordinance 8, 2023, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, rezoning certain parcels of real property being comprised of 43.41 acres in size, more or less, and consisting of three parcels, two of which comprise 13.24 acres, more or less, and have a planned unit development PUD overlay with a mixed of mix of underlying zoning consisting of residential low RL3, residential medium RM, and professional office PO, with the third parcel comprising 30.17 acres more or less and being zoned entirely RL3 to PUD overlay with an underlying zoning of RL3 so that the entire 43.41 acres more or less shall be unified in one PUD overlay, such parcels being generally located on the north side of North Lake Boulevard, approximately 1.3 miles east of Coconut Boulevard, providing that the zoning map of the City of Palm Beach Gardens be amended accordingly, providing a complex clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. Thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and open the hearing. We will go through um, ex parte again. I'll start with Carl. Negative. Dana? Nope. None. Thank you. Marcy? None. And I have none myself. So do we have another presentation or are we all set? Anyone have anything else for that? Nope. Martin, anything else to add for ordinance eight as we go down? No comment cards, so I'm going to close the hearing. May I get a motion and a second to approve, please? I'll make a motion on ordinance eight, 2023. Thank you, Carl. Second. All right, thank you, Dana. All right, do we have any further discussion since this is a combined presentation? Let's go ahead and go to vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you for collaborating with our staff and staff. Thank you for doing a beautiful job on that one. Thank you, Martin. All right, we're going to be moving on to Ordinance 9, 2023. If the clerk could please read the title. Ordinance 9, 2023, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, annexing a contiguous and compact area of unincorporated real property, comprising a total of 301.64 acres, more or less, in accordance with Section 171.0413 Florida statutes. Such parcels being generally located on the south side of North Lake Boulevard between 120th Avenue North and Great View Boulevard and on the north side of North Lake Boulevard between 130th Avenue North 
North and Avocado Boulevard, as more particularly described herein, amending Article 2 of the City Charter to redefine the corporate limits pursuant to involuntary annexation, providing for transmittal to the Florida Department of State, the Florida Governor's Office, and Palm Beach County, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for the purposes. All right, wonderful. I'm going to open the hearing. All right, so has anything changed since first reading? Uh, no, ma'am. All right, thank you, Martin. Um, is anyone currently wishing to speak on this? Because I do have a couple of comment cards. We'll start with Jeff Williams. If you could come to the podium, you'll have three minutes to please state your name, your address, and if you have been sworn in. Uh, thank you. My name is Jeff Williams. My address is 2121 Southwest Racquet Club, Palm City, Florida. Um, I am the Executive Vice President of Development and Construction for Conover South. Uh, we are the owner of one of the parcels uh, within the annexation. Uh, Conover South, we are a third generation, family owned, uh, fully integrated commercial development firm. We've done over 15 million square feet of retail, 20,000 apartment units, over 4,000 hotel units, and over 2 million square feet of office. Uh, we are long-term holders, uh, and as I said, we've been here since 1957, so we have a substantial and continued investment um, in the state um, and the surrounding communities in South Florida particularly. Um, I found out about the annexation on the 20th of this month. I was out of town, um, that the first reading was going to be on the 24th, and we had our Board of County Commissioners final vote uh, under Palm Beach County for our development approval on the 27th. So needless to say, it was a jarring um, process to learn about. So as you can imagine, instantly concerns with our entitlements, with our architecture, with our site plan, concerns with lenders for permanent and construction financing, concerns um, with you know, all the work that has gone in and concerns um, with the tenants. So it was a, um, it was a very, uh, as I said, jarring thing to learn about because we, uh, we were unaware of it. Um, since that time, um, we had, I've had several meetings, and that's, that's the reason that I'm here today. If you excuse me, I'm trying to find this. Um, I received a letter that I'd like to read into the record if I could. Um, one second, here we go. Here we go. I'm sorry, I know my time's ticking away here. If you guys could pause for a moment, I apologize. I'm just trying to I'm, find I'm sorry, no sir. No problem, it's okay, it's okay. Three minutes, you got about a minute? Okay, needless, ne needless to say, I received a letter from Natalie Crowley, and that's the reason that I'm here today, is to thank her. Um, I'm sure in the barrage of, of meetings, uh, emergency phone calls that we requested uh, that we were probably not a very easy group to work with in the last week because we were very alarmed. Um, Natalie has gone out of her way above and beyond to meet with us multiple times to provide us a letter um, that gives clarification to the process. Our main concern is what transfers from Palm Beach County over to Palm Beach Gardens. Um, and she's given us a lot of clarity in that process and a lot of confidence that we didn't have, and it has settled the fears a lot. Um, I'm sure that rec that, that um, email is on the record uh, somewhere, that letter, um, so I can re-forward it again. But I wanted to thank her and her staff um, there's a lot of people um, that I have to report to upstream. We don't have outside investors, um, so this is, this is all on our own balance sheet. So I wanted to appreciate uh, the time that she took um, to help us get past some of the hurdles that we saw and to be excited for the annexation, the process of working with Palm Beach Gardens. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Williams. We appreciate that. And um, then that will assure that email is on record. All right. I'm going to be calling Mr. Jacob Gerb. Uh, if you could come up, you'll have three minutes. Your address, please, and if you've been sworn in, sir. I have been sworn in. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor and Council. Jacob Gerb, 431 Fairway Drive, Deerfield Beach, Florida, on behalf of DKC Coconut Crossing, LLC. Uh, we are an affected party and uh, do own land that is subject to the annexation. Uh, I did speak before this council at the first reading. This time I typed everything to fit into the time, so... Uh, I hopefully, forgive me for reading, I wouldn't normally do this. Fire away. Good evening, I oh, already did that. Uh, we'd like to put two items into the record, please. Uh, the first item is an email uh, sent by me to city officials earlier today 
Um, I apologize that it only came through today. This was an email evidencing that there are 11 additional parcels within the area to be annexed. The annexed area now has 27 parcels and therefore the city does not have 50% of the parcels agreeing to the annexation. 14 consenting parcels agreeing to the annexation would be needed and the city has 10 consents. Second item we'd like to put into the record, uh, excuse me, is, uh, or rather, secondly, uh, we'd like to mention Florida Statute 171.042, subsection 2, uh, which required 15, which states that not fewer than 15 days prior to commencing the annexation procedures under the governing, under the governing body of the municipality shall file a copy of the report required by this section to the Board of County Commissioners. Uh, shall file. Uh, the record in, that the city has established shows that the city mail, emailed and sent by certified mail on April 6th. Uh, that would ordinarily appear like enough time, more than 15 days for the county. In fact, it's not. Um, the county annexation packet, which I emailed to the city, is stamped received April 10th. And the reason it's stamped is because of Florida Rule 2.514, which talks about computing times. Florida Rule of Judicial Administration. And it states that the following rules apply in computing any time periods in any statute does not specify a method for computing times. Subsection 1 says, when a period is stated in days or longer, we begin counting from the next day that is not a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday. That would be day one. So if it was emailed on April 6th, day one, to give the 15-day notice to the county would be the next day that's not a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday. April 7th, a Friday, would ordinarily qualify, except it was Good Friday, a legal holiday. Then we had Saturday and Sunday, the 8th and 9th. So day one was not until April 10th, which is how the county stamped it. And that's only 14 days prior to the first reading. The law requires 15 days and does say that the annexation may be subject to invalidation for failure to provide this time period. Uh, thank you very much. Just in closing, we would respectfully request that, uh, this, uh, that there be a motion to postpone the second reading until the city obtains the requisite consents. We are happy to work with the city on that process. Um, we also wanted to mention that the email that was referred to, and Natalie, we were hoping to uh, secure uh, expediting of our permits with the city throughout the process as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Next card is for Ramona Bean. If you could please come to the podium, uh, name, address, and if you've been sworn in, please. Good evening, Ramona Bean, yes, and uh, technically I was not sworn in, I was here, so I don't know if that, does that count? I was standing, so if you need me to swear in. You'll need to be sworn in. She doesn't, no, she doesn't. Oh, she doesn't, I apologize. My okay. public, okay, right. comment. <laughs> I was like, I apologize. Okay. No, it's okay. Um, 5439 Cicada Way, uh, good evening. Um, mayor, vice mayor, and council members, thank you for the opportunity to talk. I'm actually coming as a citizen, and I'm just um, curious on the process myself, so I just learned a few things listening to the gentleman before. Um, my question was, I did appreciate what's available on public record, so I looked through it, and it, you know, the part that says about over 50% consent is, is needed and all that. Um, so out of the, at least when it was posted on April 24th, out of the um, 16 landowners of the area um, proposed for annexation. It said um, that six of them, I believe, were, were saying no. Um, so my question was really probably for city staff, if that's okay to ask them. I, um, I wondered when, when there are parties that you know, say, hey, we're not for this, do they just follow up with them in letters or communication? And like I said, the gentleman before me, the two of them just noted that there is communication. So, but it, just as, as a curiosity, because on the record, in fact, I didn't all load up anyway. I couldn't see like why they would have said no, but it looked like it was Palm Beach County and a couple other, um, like a antenna tire, um, cell phone tire, singular wireless. Yeah, so anyway, I would, that was a curiosity. But otherwise, thank you so much for this opportunity and thank you for having the information available for the public to look at. Because it's quite a large track, but it makes a lot of sense with the urban boundary being put westward. So have a good evening, thanks. All right, thank you for your comment. The next card is Joey Eichner. If you come up, that's sworn in, name and address. Thank you. Mayor Reed, those of you on the dais, Joey Eichner, I have been sworn in. On behalf of the PGA Corridor Association, we support annexation by the city, uh, especially in this issue here where it's, it's consistent and it, and it just works. And to the prior speakers, I can tell you that I have 
recently undergone an annexation from the county to the city, and it was the smoothest, best transaction that's ever worked. I had my approvals in the county, and they brought them right into the city without any incident. Thank you, and, and I support the annexation. Thank you, sir. We have one last comment card for Donaldson hearing. If you could come to the podium, sir, state your name and address. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, for the record, Donaldson Hearing uh, with Kotler and Hearing uh, here tonight on behalf of Cornerstone Pump PBG uh, LLC. My address is 1934 Commerce Lane, Suite Number One, Jupiter, Florida. Uh, and so I'm just here on behalf of Mr. John Clancy, who is the property owner uh, at the east corner uh, of Coconut and North Lake Boulevard. Uh, and uh, we are very supportive of the request. I uh, think that City of Palm Beach Gardens is a great place to work. We've had the opportunity to meet with your staff and uh, we think that uh, uh, this is just positive for the entire quarter and look forward to working with the city and uh, also here on behalf of the PGA Corridor Association giving Joey a little bit of support tonight. So this is a good thing and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, sir, so much for coming. All right, with that, we don't have any further cards. I'm going to close the hearing. Uh, get a motion and a second to approve, please. I'll make a motion to approve resolution 25, or sorry, ordinance 9, 2023, am I on the right page? Correct, all right. May I get a second, please? I'll get a second, I'll second. Thank you, Dana. All right, before we go further, council, I'm going to ask our city attorney if he'd be so kind as to weigh in a little as we begin our conversation. Uh, certainly, Madam Mayor, thank you. Uh, you've heard of, uh, a few things mentioned tonight and a few arguments made by the representatives from DKC Coconut Crossing. Uh, so I wanted to st uh, straighten a couple things out for the record, and I'll be putting a couple items into the record uh, for the benefit of the council. First of all, the property owned by DKC Coconut is comprised of a single parcel. It has not been subdivided into 12 parcels. There are not 11 more parcels. Um, and I have here a copy of the only deed related to the most recent and only deed in the public records um, for 2022 or 2023 um, related for, to um, transferring uh, the, the parcel in question owned by DKC Coconut Crossing from North Coconut North Lake LLC to them. <clears throat> and we're putting that into evidence as city exhibit number one. And I also have a uh, screenshot of the clerk of the court's website uh, that uh, showing the public records and showing all of the um, documents that have been recorded um, for uh, DKC Coconut Crossing related to this property. Um, and it's from, and it's, uh, was done today at uh, 5, 423 at 522 PM. And that's exhibit number two. Um, what the respondent or what the attorney for DKC Coconut is discussing is about an apportionment. They apparently um, on April 27th, thereabouts, after first reading, um, requested from the property appraiser that the property be apportioned uh, into 12 taxable parcels. Um, such an apportionment does not constitute a subdivision or the creation of, cell, uh, of 12 separate alienable lots. It was not a subdivision. It's still one parcel. Um, by way of example, there are several um, properties around Palm Beach Gardens that have multiple parcel control numbers but are owned by one owner and are not separate lots. For tax purposes, um, and those of you that are familiar with commercial leasing, you'll frequently see somebody and they'll do a triple net lease. Well, they what they do is they apportion it for tax purposes and it gets assigned a PCN. And so then the lessee has to, it gets a direct pass through for their property taxes rather than it coming to the landlord and then going to the uh, lessee that way. Um, but it does not confer ownership. The Gardens Mall is a great example of that. All the major tenants at the Gardens Mall have a ground lease and they have a PCN that's separate and distinct from that of the rest of the mall. And it is a pass through, but they in no way own the property. And it's not a subdivision of the property. So just to be clear, an apportionment does not constitute a subdivision. The same number of parcels that were present on first reading are still present today. <clears throat> So in no way does the creation of a tax parcel constitute a subdivision. Additionally, they've alleged that there were infirmities in the city's notices <clears throat> related, uh, related to Ordinance 9, 2023 and the subject annexation. And I'd like to note for the record that the representatives and attorneys for D uh, DKC Coconut are present at this hearing, just as they were for the first reading held on April 24th, 2023. At that hearing, as well as this evening, they made substantive arguments far beyond merely attending to allege insufficient notice. And Florida case law is clear on this point. If one attends a hearing and makes substantive arguments beyond alleging insufficient notice, then the notice argument is waived. Failure to file the document with the county may 
if that were true, which I do not con concede that it is, may give a note may give rise for the county to have standing to challenge. But it's it's a far reach whether or not that it's questionable it, it, at a minimum whether or not it would give an interested party um, a, a any standing to challenge the notice. And again, it's hard to challenge notice when you're here and you've submitted um, substantive arguments. Um, having said that, I would encourage the council to proceed with adoption of Ordinance 9 2023 as all the legal prerequisites have been met in accordance with Chapter 171 of the Florida Statutes. Um, I think that this was uh, an attempt by DKC Coconut to um, um, encourage the city to somehow negotiate or bind itself further than it already had as with regard as far as what we have discussed with them. Um, not really bound ourselves, but uh, shared with them how we would process their application um, by attempting this tax um, apportionment. And again, tax apportionment doesn't constitute a deed and doesn't constitute a subdivision in any way. Thank you, sir. That clarifies that. Um, we'll move on. Carl, do you want to go ahead and begin? Um, I'm going to support it. Um, this is what we do. Um, I assure you, you, Mr. Person in the black shirt, um, you seem like you're, Jeff, Jeff, thank you, sorry, I didn't write it down. You seem like you're a little relieved um, that you got with our staff, and that's just a small example of going forward. Um, I assure you, being in the city of Palm Beach Gardens would be better than being in the county. Um, I said it last time that this isn't a, a legal forum, that I feel that based on our votes, based on the constituents of the city of Palm Beach Gardens, the council pushes the direction, the city a direction based on how we vote and if there's legal stuff that need to be taken care of. We've done this many times and uh, I'm gonna move forward with it myself, so thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Dana? Um, no, I, th I think we've um, gotten enough information on it and um, we've asked any questions we needed to and you know, I'll, I'll follow the lead of, of Vice Mayor Woods and, and you know I would like to approve this as well. So thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Bert. Yeah, no no comment. I'm um, I'm going to go along with the city attorney on this. That we followed all the protocol to do this. Uh, being in the city is going to be um, a good thing for that corridor to expand in. Uh, beautification. Um, we're, we're we're happy to have uh, those parcels come in and kind of solidify the western end of the city. So um, I'll fully support it along with uh, staff's work on it as well. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bert Marcy. Thank you. Um, I agree with my uh, fellow council members. I am fully supportive of annexation. As our mayor said the last time, it uh, is an opportunity to square out our borders, uh, round out our borders, I should say. Um, it's been a goal of ours for years and years to annex and take care of all those uh, enclaves that we have in the city. and. Um, I want to assure everyone uh, that we have always and will continue to accommodate existing land uses and zoning on properties. Uh, we are not in the business to take property rights away. That's, I'm a land planner by trade, and uh, that is something that I take very seriously and I would never do. I know our staff would never do it, and I can assure you they are great at what they do, and when they make reference to accommodating expedited permitting or uh, making sure that our zoning code fits a, a land use that's uh, from the county like uh, Mr. Eichner mentioned. They do it and they do it extremely well and they do it expeditiously. Um, and, and that includes if it's preservation. They'll make sure that preservation takes, uh, uh, takes the proper uh, uh, channels and meets all of the criteria and continues to be preservation and has the proper easements associated with it. Um, so we keep our development rights intact um, and I, I definitely want to assure you of that. So we have a great staff. Um, our city uh, takes care of, of all of our residents, people, business owners, etc. So um, please uh, Please don't worry. We are happy to have you in our city, um, and uh, we look forward to working with you. Thank you, and I support this. Thank you. All right. The nice thing about you guys choosing me to be mayor is I get to go last, and you all said everything I could have possibly said. Marcy, you summed up it really well. So with that, let's take a vote. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? 
All right, motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much. Moving on to resolution 20, 20 excuse me, resolution 22, 2023. If you could please read the title, Patty. Resolution 22, 2023, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving a site plan and major conditional use for a 600 student charter school on approximately 7.26 acres, more or less, within the residential parcel, parcel A, of the Avenir Plan Community Development PCD, the subject site being generally located on the south side of Avenir Drive and approximately 1,500 feet, more or less, west of the intersection of Avenir Drive and Coconut Boulevard is more particularly described herein, providing conditions of approval, providing waivers, providing an effective date for other purposes. Thank you so much, Patty. With that, I'm going to open the hearing. We do have to declare ex parte for this. I'll start to my right. Marcy, do you have any ex parte on resolution 22? None. All right, moving along to Bert. None. Dana? None. Carl? Negative. Neither do I. So we're going to, hello, we're going to have uh, Ken Tuma from Urban Design Studios here at our podium. Have you been sworn in, sir? I have. Good evening. Ken Tuma with Urban Design. My address is 610 Clamata Street, West Palm Beach, Florida, 33401. I've been sworn in, Madam Mayor. Thank you for having me here this evening. Here tonight on behalf of Avenir Charter School. And what is in front of you this evening is a charter school, which for all intents and purposes is a public school located within Avenir. It's located on a 7.26 acre parcel of land within Avenir. A couple things about a charter school and the presentation this evening. I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about a charter school. Then I'm gonna have Willie Taggart and Marla DeVitt from the school who are responsible for security and operations. Come and talk to you all about what a charter school is and then I'm gonna come back up and talk about the matter that's in front of you this evening, which is a matter of a site plan approval. So very quickly, a charter school, the charter school that's being proposed is a school, it's a K through five school. It will be 600 students. I just wanna address a couple items from day number one, the master plan of Avenir. Avenir always showed a school site within the site data table. There was a 600 student school site. That's what we're proposing this evening. Also in that, in that overall approval was, a lo was the ability to allow for a K through five school and the traffic capacity was reserved at that time. Just a little bit about a charter school. A charter school is a free school. It's a school for any resident of Palm Beach County to attend. Charter schools typically in this particular charter school, which will be a Somerset Academy, will be generally within an area of three to six miles of radius within that school of people who will attend that school. Transportation is not provided, so parents do do drop-offs for the school. Also, this being uniquely wrapped within Avenir, it's also connected directly to the Avenir multimodal pathway and also the eight-foot pathway. I'm gonna ask Marla to get up first and talk a little bit about the school and also the key components of the school. It is going to be a STEM school. And then after that, uh, Mr. Taggart will get up for a few minutes and speak about safety and security, which from the second we met these folks, that was the number one thing that they had in mind during their design of the school. So Marla, if you don't mind, thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Marla Devitt. Um, my office address is uh, 6340 Sunset Drive, Miami, Florida. Uh, I uh, am here and had um, been sworn in earlier this evening. Um, I am an employee of Academica, the education service and support provider for Somerset Academy. But I kind of feel that I wear the hat of Somerset Academy because I have been around since Somerset opened its doors 26 years ago with 50 students in a two-room schoolhouse in Miramar, Florida. Today, Somerset Academy is educating in over 75 schools throughout the country in Florida, Texas, Nevada, and Arizona, and even virtually, um, employing over 2,000 teachers and educating over 45,000 students. A lot of our schools are A-rated schools and high-performing schools. One of our sister schools that you may be familiar with is Somerset Canyons. It's a 612 school um, in Boynton Beach. Um, but uh, what's looking to be proposed here is an elementary school, a K-5 elementary school with 600 students. Uh, like Mr. Tuma said, it, this will be a STEM school, which focuses on science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, the programs that Somerset has done 
Somerset is a family environment. You will see when you come in, we want our parents there volunteering at the school because we feel that parents being part of their child's education ultimately gives better outcomes to both the school and the students on the campus. Um, we are focused on continuous improvement. Somerset was a pioneer. It was one of the first three charter schools that opened in Broward County, just down the road. Um, but during that time, we kept opening schools and our schools, every time they opened, they'd go through this arduous accreditation process that would take them going through the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, now Cognia, to be accredited so that we could get that stamp of approval. But every school was doing this individually. And in 2009, Somerset decided we have all these schools that are doing this on their own, but ultimately they're part of a corporate system. Let's go out and ask SACS if we can have corporate system accreditation. So they were pioneers and they did that. They went out and got corporate system accreditation. And now they all the schools, when they open, they are automatically accredited to have that gold seal of approval that it's a quality education program. So we want to bring that here to Avenir. Thank you. Next up will be Willie Taggart. He's in charge of safety and security for Somerset. Good evening. Uh, I'm, my name is William Tago. I have been sworn in. Um, good evening, Vice uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council. Um, I'm a retired Deputy Chief of Miami-Dade, and uh, when I retired, I came over as the Director of Safety Security for the Charter School for Academica. Our current office is at 6340 Sunset Drive. Primary, my job is to make sure that we're in constant compliance with the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Safety Act. Um, each year, there's always something new coming up, but one of my main job is to make sure that we're in compliance. Just because we're a charter school doesn't mean anything. We got to maintain that compliance with Marge Stoneman Douglas, meaning we must have a single point of entry, outer perimeter, inner perimeter uh, fencing, that we have a mobile device that will alert if there is something going on at the school. Uh, I've also had an open lines of communication with Chief, with Chief Shannon as far as the future site on what are we going to uh, do. Um, I've also advise him uh, if he's going to advise me of whichever staff he wants me to work with to uh, maintain the open lines of communication when we're in the process of building the school because one of the things I would love to do is for them to do a a walkthrough along with the fire department I don't want to leave them out as well because it's also the fire department and the police are also very important that they should know about this school site and also to familiarize themselves with the school Things that we were talking about earlier is uh, having an, an officer at the school. It's one of the options. I know there's options out there with Guardian, state certified, but one of the things that we want to do is maintain that relationship with the community, with Palm Beach Gardens, and having the police department there as well. Thank you for allowing me a bit of difference on that. I know charter schools are, there are several charter schools within the city. Now I'm gonna come back to kind of the matter that's in front of you, which is a site plan a site plan request this evening. So the subject site is located within Avenir. It's right here in the newly annexed area of the city of Palm Beach Gardens. It's just north of that property. It's right against it and within the city of Palm Beach Gardens. And uh, I'll talk to you about the buffer in a few seconds. But what's in front of you is a K through five uh, grade school for up to 600 uh, students. I said earlier, the school capacity, the concurrency have all been dealt with when Avenir was approved back in 2016. So there is no request for additional traffic in this approval that's in front of you this evening. There's also a major conditional use. That major conditional use is applicable to any school that would come in front of you, public, private, or charter. The request and location, kind of in a little blow up here of where the subject site is, identified by the red circle. Everything on the west side is still conceptual. It's not been in front of you for approval, but to give you an idea of its connection, it's important to note that the 12 foot multimodal path along Avenue Drive is on the south side. On the north side is the eight foot, walk the eight foot walkway. 
So a little bit about the charter school in, in more detail. In Brown is a 42,577 square foot building. It is two stories. Its maximum height is 31 feet of height. Inside of that are the typical things that you would see in a school, a computer lab, a media library, cafeteria, music, classrooms, playrooms. There's basketball equipment and, all, um, and play fields all the way around the facility. Also, there is STEM, as Marla had indicated, is an important part of this site. A couple things on this slide to note, and I'll walk you through in more detail. You'll notice this pond here along the south side. We are requesting one waiver this evening. That waiver is a request to reduce the lake maintenance easement on that pond from 15 feet to 8, 15, excuse me, from 20 feet to 15 feet. One thing to note, Willie mentioned security. Just to start with security on that pond, all the way along it is a six foot high fence, all the way around it. So the pond is completely encased. No one's gonna be able to go in there. No children are gonna be able to get into that pond. The next item in front of you is kind of the general avenue, uh, uh, the avenue uh, uh, property development regulations. 35% of open space is required, 66% is being provided. Interesting, the building itself this building, the 42,000 square foot building, is brought up within 30 feet, 33 feet of the Avenir Drive or the Avenir Setback, which is different than what you see in the other parts of Avenir, but it's gonna bring that building up along Avenir Drive. It's a nice, unique, it brings it as part of the community and then place kind of the more ancillary uses in the rear. Um, there, are, there are specific requirements for parking. 96 parking spaces are required. There are uh, 176 spaces available. Of that, 75 are vehicle spaces. 13 are golf cart spaces located in this general area. There are 40 bicycle spaces, which are located here and here. And then also there's a significant amount of queuing, which I'll show you a little bit later. There's 88 spots of queuing available for drop-off. On this slide, you'll notice these little squares here. Those squares are drop-off zones for children, um, and there are 14 spaces available there. So kind of some big picture on the site plan itself. I don't have any labels on this. I just have a, just a colored picture. This is the actual building itself, two stories, 42,000 square feet. Starting on the right-hand side of the screen, this is the, the eastern parking lot. You'll notice that it's gated here. This is an access point for deliveries, and then also in the morning, it'll be open for teachers to come in and park in this general area. But this is not a parent access point. It's a right out only. And then on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll notice this is the main entrance point for students and their parents for drop-off. There's a full left turn lane coming in and a right turn lane, and then I'll walk you through kind of the queuing in a few more slides. One thing to note here are the connections to the Avenir system of the uh, Avenir sidewalk system. So this slide, while it's a rendering, kind of explains how the access works and the circulation within the site. First, to kind of give you a view of the building, You'll notice the 12 foot avenue, the existing avenue, the existing avenue multimodal path. Then you'll notice this entranceway here, kind of this gazebo structure, an entranceway. It's a secured entranceway. There are two of them. And then in front of it, you'll notice the sign, the tower element, and also some of the design features of the building. But if you look at these two cars on the right hand side, first you'll note a six foot high decorative fence and a column. That six foot high decorative fence is all along the front of that building to provide protection. And then also there are sliding gates behind it. But when you come in and you drop off your son or, son or daughter, you pull in here and you wrap your way around and then you come back and here are those drop off zones that I was talking about before. And they have access and there are also other safety items built in within that design. So a little bit about the entry itself. The employee gate on the right-hand side opens at 6.30 a.m., closes at 9 a.m. The site right here allows cars and teachers to come in and park. The parent drop-off gate here on the left-hand side opens at 7 a.m. and allows for parents to come and drop off their child into the school. So a couple things about the drop-off time. We are proposing a staggered drop-off time within the transportation manual that is, that is part of this project. K through uh, first grade will be dropped off from 7.30 a.m. to 8 a.m. Second through fifth grade will be from 8 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. And then the pickup times, of course, are staggered also. One thing to note on pickup times, I know most of you are parents, 
at pickup times, about 40% of, the, only about 40% of the students are picked, or excuse me, 40% of the students are in some other activity after school. They're either staying in aftercare or they're playing a sport. So not everyone's coming right at 3 p.m. to pick up their child. So the afternoon peak hour is typically much less because of those staggered times and also the uh, people staying after school. Um, a little bit about the landscape. I'm going to walk you through the buffers just to give you a feel of what the building looks like and kind of the general design. The, the landscape itself is a mix of southern live oaks, silver buttonwoods, dahoon hollies, um, all surrounded throughout the entire project, generally within the theme that all of Avenir is, generally in the same tone of design. Um, significantly above the required landscape points, significantly above the required open space. There are buffers that surround the site. As uh, Willie mentioned, the site is protected. Along the western side, there is a three foot high berm, and on top of that berm, there will be an eight foot high wall. On the southern side, there will be, a, there's a 25 foot wide buffer. There's also on top of that, a six foot high fence. Let me make sure I got that right. I think I did. And then along the east side of the site is another buffer, and that buffer is also a, I can't believe I can't remember this, eight foot high, I knew I'd get it from the peanut gallery, eight foot high fence. And don't you not think that I'm not gonna hear the end of this a little later on this evening. So uh, Ms. Tumig identified from the back that it's an eight foot high fence on the east side. So a little bit about um, the academy itself, I know Marla went into details, established in, uh, back, in, uh, back in 1997, so it has been around for quite a while. A little bit about the charter school ramp up. From day one, not everyone comes into the school and starts from day one. It's a five year ramp up. Typically they see about 200 additional students a year. They get to that 600 student by year five. There are 29 classrooms in the overall site. And for some reason, a slide is missing. This is a little bit about the school itself. Here's the roof plan. And we do have one waiver this evening. That waiver is for, that waiver is for the reduction of the width of the lake maintenance easements throughout the site. And those lake maintenance easement in this area and this area go from 20 feet to 15. You'll note along the front of the building is a 16 foot wide sidewalk. That's one of the reasons why we're reducing that down, that 16 foot sidewalk identified here. And one second, please. I do wanna show you an important slide about the staggering, or excuse me, about the transportation component. I think we lost a transition. So on this slide in front of you is how the, the blue line, which didn't show up a second ago, the blue line shows how the storage of cars comes. So as you come into the site, you'll notice that you have the ability to turn into the site and then you have these blue lines. These blue lines are vehicles stacking up to 88 uh, cars are stacking to come into the drop off time. Also, the access points along the front are controlled. The, the access point in, on the main entrance point is a full intersection. That full intersection though, it, which allows for a right turn in and a left turn into the building, there are 400 feet of stacking in this area. However, at peak times during drop off and pick up, it's a right turn movement only out of this. So you cannot take that left turn during drop off or pick up. It will be signed that during those times you can only take the right turn here. And that's on purpose to allow for flow of traffic. So a little bit about the architecture of a school. We had, did make some designs based on the comments of your planning and zoning board. We created uh, some different recessions, or excuse me, some different dips within the building. And here you can see the floor plan of the, of the school itself, of the computer laboratory on the west side, and then on the right-hand side of the screen is a cafeteria. And the second floor and the 29 classrooms that are both on the first and second floor. 
This is a view of the roof plan showing the design of the building, how the air conditioning units are being blocked. And the waiver request, as I mentioned a little bit before, was a reduction from 20 feet to 15 feet. We have your planning and zoning uh, board of recommendation approval. Your staff has been great to work with. This project has taken a little bit of time as our client has worked their way through the process. And we look forward to answering any questions you may have. We have our whole team, including our transportation engineers here this evening. We have, we have both representatives from the school. So our whole team is here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, Samantha, do we have a staff presentation this evening? No staff presentation. Ken was very thorough. Excellent. All staff right. is in support of the one requested waiver and staff recommends approval of the project. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks, Samantha. All right. Anyone else wishing to speak? I don't have any comment cards. So we will close this hearing. May I please have a motion and a second to approve resolution 2020. Sorry, I keep doing that. Resolution 22 2023. I'll make a motion on resolution 22 2023. I'll second. All right. Thank you so much. Carl, do you want to go ahead and have some discussion? Um, I have no questions. Some things are a privilege to vote on, and this will be one of them. Um, and I've also been privileged to vote on pretty much every, everything that's, that's been approved in Avenir. I've been able to vote on it. It's just fabulous. It's a great place for a school. Um, there's not much to be said. It's, you know, can you do a great job on presentation? I know when it, if it gets by Natalie and staff, and planning and zoning, it's going to be a good project. So on this one, it's an easy, it's an easy yes for me. And, um, you know, I'm tickled to have you guys there. So I'm not going to gloat on it too much because I'm sure they can, you know. So thank you for showing up and doing that. All right, we're going to move on down the line. Dana? I'm excited Dana. about the project. So, I, you know, seeing Avenir come together with all these different amenities and, and services for, for everybody, families and everything, I'm excited about it. I do have a couple questions about safety and security. Um, I know everyone's always concerned about traffic with the drop-off and pickup of kids and everything. Um, you did make concessions in there for bikes and golf carts. How does that flow work with cars um, all happening at the same time? So cars, bikes, and Golf carts. <laughs> no, no, fair, fair point. I did not do a great job of explaining that. Let me pull it right back up on the screen. So, oops. So there are access points here and here that will be for pedestrians, bikes, and golf carts will have access to these golf cart spot, parking spots. And then here will be the access point for the bicycle and the walkers that we expect to be within Avenir. The vehicles will be generally in this area doing drop-offs. I had any other questions on that? So, no, I'm excited, I'll, I'll move on. I would definitely approve this. Happy to bring it back to you if you need anything. Bert, please. All right, Ken, don't sit down yet. Yes, sir. <laughs> Can you just explain to me, as the golf carts park on the east side, the bikes come in from the road, just show me the entryways into the building for all of these different transportation types. Is there a single entry into the building in the corner? Is that what we, is that what they're doing? So, so this is once, oh, how you actually get into the building or get past the gate. So this- No, I'm worried, I'm worried about if people are non-cars. So the golf carts, the walkers, the golf, the bike, okay. you know, whatever. Where are they? They're parking. I see where they're parking, but where do they get into the building? Okay, so there's so there's two layers of security here. I'm going to ask Willie to come up to also to address that. The first layer is the gate coming into. So this is coming off of the side, off of the multimodal path. Right. You'll notice there's an access gate underneath this gazebo. There's one here, and there's one on the. Uh, I guess that would be the east side. So there are two of these gates that are the access points. Okay. The next question, sir, which I think is, how do you get into the school? And I will go to that slide. And, and I'm going to call him William, not Willie. I don't, he doesn't look like a Willie. I'm going to call him William. Yes, sir. Yeah. Please come on up. You got it. Uh, I think the question you're asking is to get into the building. It's going to be a single point of entry. Okay, that, that's and and we're going to single point of entry with someone monitoring there, whether it be staff or guardian or police. Okay. Yeah, because I just, you're going to have drop off. You're going to have golf cart. You're going to have Absolutely. walkers. You're going to yeah. have bikes. So they all got to come into a funnel, right? You got to get them Absolutely. In one way into the school and that's it. All oh, right. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Great. That's, that was my, my main question. But as far as the project, um, 
you know, I try to look at these things as if the whole community around it is developed. So in this case, it was already approved for 600 children way back when, uh, when there was really smart people like me on the council, I guess, uh, back then. I had to get that in there, I'm sorry. But um, <laughs> no, I, I know from the city's experience with all the public schools in the city, as well as charter schools that we've built, uh, working with our public safety divisions, um, I know we're good at this. There's no doubt about it. And I'm sure William here um, is going to take care of the situation as well for the students as this thing is built and then it grows into the, the full capacity that it is. I love the stacking on the road. I love the stacking on the site. I mean, you're talking m maybe 150 cars all in on both sides and on the property. Uh, that's pretty impressive, to tell you the truth, as you're keeping traffic flowing and moving. Um, I like the, uh, the operator, the quality of the operator, which is important. Uh, we want somebody in there that's going to be there a long time for the community and for the kids. Um, so I love the connectivity. I think it's a, a great project, and uh, I'm glad to welcome them to the city. Thank you. Excellent, Bert. Marcy? Thank you. So many of us remember in 2016, of May, actually, when we approved Avenir, and fast forward to today, and all most of the communities are under construction, are approved, and they definitely need a school just like this, so it's super important. And those, like, to your point, those of us that have spent decades dropping kids off to school, uh, multiple decades, knows what it does on a road network. And um, this elementary school, this uh, mixed-use development, I should say, um, having an elementary school within it is paramount, and it's key to keeping trips, uh, uh, traffic trips, cars off of North Lake Boulevard. So I'm so glad that this is here. It's very important to a true mixed-use development. Um, you know, Avenir was a 20-year build-out, which I think is happening in 10 years, and this is a five-year build-out, which, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure that it's going to happen in less than five years because of what's happening with development um, in general. And it's going to happen just as quick um, as the kids are growing <laughs> in this school. Um, so uh, per the traffic report, uh, 300 students will be dropped off in the peak hours. It's a lot. but. I truly appreciate you um, almost doubling uh, the turn, the left turn lane in, which is actually double what a standard turn lane is. So that is um, very much appreciated because uh, it will definitely be used. Um, and obviously the right turn lane going into the site. Um, so that is also key to um, perfect traffic flow. Um, I kind of chuckled when the traffic report said that it's all going to happen in 15 minutes and I was like whoa <laughs> good luck with that <laughs> but I'm sure you'll do it and I really appreciate you having a traffic control um, officer um, and that's it I truly support it thank you so much good job agreed don't have a great council they, they say great things um, thank you Ken for not just bringing us the site plan but actually history and security, we, we really, really made a big difference. We'd love to see more of that going forward and, and opportunities like this. I love the, um, like Bert said, the connectivity, the access to the 12-foot multimodal um, path. My question is about the pickup and the drop-off. If you have a, because I was a parent of two children that were separate in age by about three years, which meant that when my first grader or pre-K child was being picked up, I couldn't get my other one, and that was really difficult for work and everything. So, can you tell me how you stagger the pickup if you have a? What we do, what we have is a mini care. Okay. Sorry. What we have is a mini care. Mm -hmm. So we know that those parents, they're not going to want to come and drop off one kid and come 20 minutes later and drop off the other one. So that means that one child is going to be late <laughs> yeah. so that the other one is a little early. And, and missing out on education is never something that we want to do. So we offer many care. In the morning, the first group of kids, they'll get dropped off. Everybody dropped off. One will go into a holding room and the others will go to class. At the end of the day, those younger kids will go to the holding room. They'll wait for their older siblings. Their older siblings will pick them up and dismiss. Now, one thing that, we didn't sp that I didn't mention, we have a thing called silent dismissal. So every car will be issued a car tag. That car tag will be associated with the child. So as soon as we, we'll have people out writing down the tag numbers, and as soon as 123 comes in, 
you put that in the system, 123 is going to go to those classrooms to tell those two children, hey, get ready, you're on your way out. So by the time that the cars come around in the loop, the kids will be out there to jump in the car, escorted by staff, and get on their way. Where were you about 15 years ago? <laughs> that would have made a big difference. No, I appreciate it. That's a great answer. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Silent dismissal kind of came about around the time of the pandemic. Okay. Um, but as far as the other staggering, we've been doing many care for years. Excellent. All right. Well, hopefully we'll even learn more about that. Okay, yep. great. I don't have any further questions. Anyone else want to come back to you for anything? All right, lovely. Let's go ahead and uh, take this to vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Motion passes unanimously. Welcome to Palm Beach Gardens. Thank you. Congratulations. All right. We're moving on to Resolution 23-2023. If uh, the clerk would kindly read the title, please. Resolution 23-2023, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending the Gardens Business Center Site Plan, parcels 27.05 and 27.06 of the Regional Center Plan Community Development, PCD, to permit the construction of a 5,871 square foot retail building on a 1.36 acre parcel Gardens Business Center being generally located on the north side of PJ Boulevard and including parcels east and west of Minx Gardens Boulevard, as more particularly described herein, providing conditions of approval, providing waivers, providing an effective date, and for other purposes. All right, let's go ahead and open this hearing. We do need to um, declare ex parte, so I'm going to start down with Carl. Do you have an ex parte for this, Carl? All right, Dana? Nope. None. All right, Marcy? None. And neither do I. And we still have Ken here with us. Ken Tuma from Urban Design Studios at the podium. Have you been sworn in? Name and address. Uh, good, good evening, Ken Tum with Urban Design Studio. Yes, I've been sworn in. My address is 610 Clematis Street, West Palm Beach, Florida, 33401. I've been sworn in. Uh, what's in front of you this evening is a, is a parcel of land that was an old BB&T bank located at the northeast corner of Minx and PGA Boulevard. It was part of the Gardens Business Center, which was under the old MacArthur number of 2505 and 06, or 2705 and 06 way back 20 years ago. That center was developed, actually, I think Mr. Eichner is here, That's, and he currently is the president of the Property Owners Association within that center. Uh, we are here this evening with the request to demolish the BB&T building and construct a new Diamonds Direct, which is a specialty realty, special realty store. So retail store. So here the subject site located on the screen in front of you is the Gardens Mall, Palm Beach State College is here. This is Minx Boulevard, the 1.38 1, the 1. acre parcel of land within the overall Gardens Business District is located in the red box in front of you. Kind of a blow up of this site, you'll notice that it is an, a bank building, an old bank building. It has three drive-through lanes with a bypass lane. The subject building is about 3,100, excuse me, 3,400 square feet. Our request is to replace it with approximately 5,800 square foot building. You'll note when you see the new plan, though, that we're eliminating all this asphalt around the subject site because we're eliminating the drive-through. So what's in front of you this evening is a major site plan amendment for the redevelopment of this site to allow for a 5,871 square foot specialty retail store, uh, which is the Diamonds Direct. Also, we're going to be requesting an additional sign through a waiver. So the, the way the code works, we're allowed one sign. That sign is on the south side of PGA Boulevard. We're going to be requesting an additional sign on the east side, which is where the main parking lot is for this site. Your planning and zoning board reviewed this and approved the project 7-0. Uh, here is the existing master plan way back from uh, 2000. The site here identified in red. This is the existing condition and more of a color graphic. There are some significant existing mature trees along the north side, along the west side. Also, the PGA Boulevard corridor overlay exists here, the 55-foot overlay. Uh, so one of the design characteristics of this was to keep all the existing mature trees and then also to enhance the corridor where it was possible. This is the proposed building, 5,871 square feet. On the earlier slide, you'll note that the existing dumpster is located here, 
we're gonna be relocating it to a spot closer to the building also so it's not as visible where it is today and then bringing it up to today's code. We're also enhancing the existing pedestrian connections identified in the squares in front of you. We'll also be enhancing the planting along the PGA corridor overlay. The differential here will be areas where there were some, where there were some trees missing. We'll be adding additional trees. We'll also be adding LED lighting. Um, art in public places, with this uh, applicant will be making a donation for a public transportation shelter. The landscape uh, as proposed on the site is a mix of landscape trees, including Royals, Alexanders, Montgomery's wrapping the entire building, connection points throughout. Additional frontage along the front, we'll be adding some muley grass here identified. Here we'll be doing some cleanup, there's some dead material, and we'll be doing some cleanup on the PGA overlay. A couple key things when you compare this building to the earlier building, a significant amount of additional foundation planting is available on this site because we're bringing the building closer to the road and there's not a road going all the way around it. Along the west side, there's a 10, uh, 9.7 foot foundation planting. Along the east side, it gets up to 15.5 feet. There also will be some amenities design, which I'll show you on the next slide. We're having this outdoor seating area along the entrance point of the building. This is an amenity, it's a bench area to allow for people to sit and relax and enjoy the area. You'll note though on this slide, you start getting a feel for the architecture style. It's contemporary, more modern, more modern than what's out there today. Um, you'll notice the use of glass, awnings, the design of the stucco. You'll also see there's some sconces, and then you'll note the design features here to allow for access into the building while providing protection into the building. So a couple things, one of the big items with the neighbors and also with the city is how is this going to be compatible with the neighbors? Because the buildings, again, were 20 years old, they're barrow tile roofs. Well, the design concept here to allow this to become more modern was to keep the roof pitches exactly the same as what's out there today. So when you'll see the existing buildings have this Mediterranean barrow tile roof, but you'll note the pitches are exactly the same, whereas this building has a more modern standing seam roof, a little darker color, but it promotes those design features to come together. That was really important for the Property Owners Association and also for the regional mall who also had reviewing authority over this. The second thing that makes this design technique is how the banding um, was wrapped together, you know, consistent stucco banding. But you'll also notice different design features. Arches here, no arches here, a little darker windows, a little more, a little more clear glass and contemporary look. So kind of trying to mirror with the design concepts that are occurring all along PGA Boulevard with an existing center that is 20 years old. So this is a view of the east elevation. This is the elevation that's in the parking lot. You can see the beautiful building that's in front of you. You'll notice the, the, the clear glass, the design, how light it appears on the inside. This is a building that is going to be selling diamonds and, uh, and, and all types of items from jewelry to people. So the idea is have it open, have it visible, and then also allow for natural light to come in. And here's another view of the entry point. This is a view from the north looking south. I mentioned that relocated dumpster a little earlier. Here you can see all the heavy landscaping that surrounds the building itself. And then you'll note how the parking lot terminates here instead of going around the building. Uh, one thing about traffic, the, the traffic on this site, well, from a daily traffic generation, it's 46 more trips than what was allowed before, but that's not how you measure traffic. You measure traffic by peak hour, and the peak hour is a negative 14 trips in the a.m. and a negative 17 peak in the p.m., so therefore the traffic that you feel will be less because of the use than what was, what was there before being a drive-in bank. We do have one waiver in front of you this evening that requests is allow for an additional wall sign on the east elevation. Uh, that wall sign is 63 square feet, and the intent of that wall sign is to allow for the folks in the parking lot to have a view of the entrance point, and also, frankly, from the PGA overlay, there's a lot of landscaping on the, on the south side of the building, so by having a sign on the east side, it kind of gives as you're driving westbound on PGA Boulevard, just a little bit more view of the building. And this is a sign that we're requesting. We have your staff support and recommendation for this. We have your planning and zoning board recommendation for this, and I would appreciate your approval this evening. Thank you for your time. I have the whole team here can answer any questions you may have.
You can. You're, you spoiled us last time. We're going to start asking for people who've been doing it for 30 years and the security team. It was great. All right. So uh, do we have a staff presentation, Olivia? No staff presentation. All right. Thank you so much. Okie dokie. So we don't have anyone else listening to speak or any comment cards. So let's go ahead and close the hearing. May I get a motion and a second to approve, please? Make a motion to approve resolution 2023-2023. Thank you, Dana. Second. All right. So we're going to bring it back for discussion. So let's go ahead and, Dana, you passed the motion. So let's have you start. Diamonds. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess my question is a little bit about security, you know, kind of um, for the building and um, of course, they want it as a retailer, I'm sure, to be easily accessible. Um, you know, is there any consideration or does there need to be any consideration because of the type of building and the type of retail environment that it is? Jeff is here from, from Diamonds. He can answer that question, but I'll let you know there are vaults and security systems within the facility. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council. Um, Jeff Baer, um, sorry, oh, sorry. Corporate address is 4521 Sharon Road um, in Charlotte. And I was been sworn in. in. Yep. Can you hear me okay? Have you been sworn in? Sworn in? I'm sorry? Have you been sworn in? Yes, I was sworn. Um, we do, for security purposes, we do have a, an officer or a guard on any of our stores anytime the building is occupied. So whenever the staff gets in in the morning, and then when we're open for business to, to the public, we'll have a police officer on duty in the building with us. Um, as far as access, we do have a access control situation where we can control people coming in and out on a single door. That's something that we'll work out with the fire marshal, whatever details we have to formulate for that. Um, and of course, then we have the alarm systems and you know the normal procedures that we follow for insurance purposes. Thank you. Uh, if I can add as well, just from staff's perspective, based on the nature of the use, there was, there was uh, a higher scrutiny from our police department. So through the crime prevention through environmental design standards that our police department utilizes um, and is sort of at the forefront on, they've, they've incorporated principles. There's additional lighting and there's conditions of approval reflected in the resolution which uh, for example, pre prevents landscaping in front of the windows. So there's visibility, uh, higher visibility. So our police department has worked closely in the development review process on this. Thanks. Thank you. Go ahead, Bert. Yeah, no, that was my question in the agenda review yesterday, uh, talking with Chief Shannon Cho. Um, Security-wise is paramount, but I know we've kind of focused on that for the planning of the whole building and the guard being there as well um, during operating hours is... is um, extremely beneficial. Even though it's on the corridor and you're in the gardens, um, you know, safety is paramount. One way in, one way out with a guard and all your security systems around it. We appreciate that. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Bert. Marcy? No, all my questions have been answered. Thank you, guys. And I just hope my husband shops there. <laughs> <laughs> Carl? Um, I like that it's not a traffic attractor. I'm sure you don't have it stuffed with people all the time. So... Um, I know the corridor is going to support it, so I'm going to support it. And um, you guys don't know this, but I was a cop for most of my life. And I remember not too long ago, there was a jewelry store in Jupiter that um, they went, they, they got into the building through the roof. And they, they got cleaned out. So, stupid question or not, or is, is the roof reinforced? Or are you going to have cameras on the roof? Or how do you... Because they're going to do something as crazy to get in as, you know. Sure, let's, let's talk about it. Let me put it this way. We do have measures in place with the alarm systems that we Fair use. Enough. I don't, for because this is a public forum, I would prefer not to have to detail how we do things. But I, I can agree. assure you that there are things in place to slow I, somebody I down. I accept that answer. So uh, it just crazy stuff happens. So uh, it's good. We're going to have a great store, and you're going to be a great, uh, you know. It's a fair to question, the believe no me. I've, about it. I've seen, I've seen it. I'm all. sure you have. Thank you for your answer, sir. Thank Appreciate it. Anything else, Carl? 
I think that's all the dumb questions I have. No, that was actually, <laughs> we were over here saying that was excellent, but that was, that was like a Batman answer. No, no, I he like told it. me like, it was a dumb question. We've got this. We've got this. We can't tell you, but we're okay. That's, that's wonderful. It's a true story. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, you guys did a great job asking the questions, uh, and we always love to see a decrease in traffic, at, especially at peak time. So, so it's a great location, great spot. I think you guys will be very busy, and so yeah, let's really. uh, bring it to vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously, and again, welcome to Palm Beach Gardens. Thank you. I, I closed that, Carl. <laughs> All right, we're moving on to Resolution 17, 2023. If the clerk would be so kind as to read the title. Resolution 17, 2023, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving the appointment of two resident trustees to the City of Palm Beach Gardens <laughs> Police Officers Pension Board, providing an effective date for other purposes. Thank you so much, Patty. Uh, Arian. Good evening Hi. again. You can see me from under the... <laughs> I wore my flats today. <laughs> so tonight I'm here to speak about Resolution 17, which concerns the Police Pension Board. The Police Pension Board was created to administer the pension plan for the city's police officers. The board is comprised of five members, two of whom were elected by the membership, one appointed by the board, and two appointed by council. Tonight, under Resolution 17, we are seeking council's approval to appoint two resident members to the positions currently held by Brad Seidensticker and Sean O'Brien, both of whom acknowledge their interest to remain on the board. In addition, a total of three applications have been received and were attached for council's review and consideration for a Howard Brown, a Nina Kraus, and a Robert DeGloria. I've spoken with the other members of the Police Pension Board, and they have expressed their full support for the reappointment of the two existing members, Mr. Seidensticker and Mr. O'Brien. They also expressed the boards, uh, the current board members have worked together for many years and have established a strong working relationship that has proven to be effective in managing the pension plan. And staff recommends approval. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We currently do not have any comment cards, so we're going to go ahead and if I could get a motion and a second, please. I'll make a motion to move resolution 17 2023 appointing Brad Seiden sticker and Sean O'Brien. All right. May I get a second? Board. Thank you, sir. May I get a second, please? I'll second. Mercy. All right. So uh, do we want to talk about this a little bit? Is there any discussion? No, I, I think it's great to have experience members back on the board. Uh, we did have other applicants apply as well who um, checked boxes for other boards as well. So please, let's keep them in mind as other positions open up, whether it's on this board or other boards, to, to bring those people into the fold because it's always great when people want to volunteer uh, in the city and, and learn about the way things operate on different committees. So thank you if you would do that. All right. Anyone else have anything they'd like to add at all? No, I agree with what Bert said. That That's so true. It's so nice to have so many volunteers, and sometimes we don't have any, and sometimes we yeah. have a slew. So yeah. I appreciate every one of them, and hopefully yeah. that we can include them in the future. That's close to my heart, because I was on recreation and budget oversight, and I, I think it's a great way to learn what goes on in the city. So let's, let's encompass those individuals on other boards if something opens up. That'd be Absolutely. great. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and all right. So no one else has anything else. And so I will say for everyone who does apply, we sincerely, sincerely appreciate it. And those who do serve and especially those that return each year to continue serving, we sincerely appreciate it. So let's bring it to vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much. That's it. Next, we have items for council discussion and items of interest. Uh, does anyone on our council team have anything they'd like to discuss of interest mercy i just want to say thank you patty for all your many many years of service we truly appreciate everything that you do for us um, i know you remind us about stuff you keep us in check and we totally approve well i'm speaking for the council here i'm sure they don't mind but i i know we all totally appreciate you and thank you thank so much you. Thank you all very, very much, and I truly appreciate the orchid. That was beautiful, very thoughtful. Thank you. You read the card? I did read the card. I'm sorry, I, I spelled your name wrong. I think I'm sorry, and it's my fault. But 
I'll correct it. I'll get you one of my business kidding. cards. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, anyone else have anything they'd like to say? I, I do want to just say one thing. I think tonight we, we had a, a large agenda and we got through it well uh, as, a, as a team up here for sure. But I think the one thing that the takeaway is that our staff is extraordinary. We heard nothing but accolades about all you guys do. Um, Sometimes I feel like you're drowning in the amount of information that you process, okay, as, as I get a pile of paper like this, but um, that means that you guys have touched these papers, right? So we're signing them and you are the folks that push it through, that help people who are concerned about being annexed, who are um, you know, trying to build schools. This is extraordinary. So thank you guys so much. It's an honor to work with you. And with that, we'll move on to our city attorney report. Only that Patty was actually 12 when she started working for the record. <laughs> um, other than that, I don't have anything. But we were wondering about that. All right. So if there's no other business, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.